Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by SmartThings. SmartThings let you monitor, control, and automate your home from wherever you are using your smartphone. Right now, SmartThings is offering Know How listeners 10% off any home security or solutions kit and get free shipping in the United States when you go to smartthings.com slash twit and use the offer code twit at checkout. Today on Know How, everything you wanted to know about PWM but were afraid to ask, how to store your quad, oh, and uh, steampunk. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next 45 to 50 minutes... Give or take, we're a little rusty, we're so really rusty. who knows how long this 30 will minutes, take. 25 minutes, so who knows, <laughs> but we are going to give you some of the projects that we've been working on so that you can take them home and geek out yourself. Kick back, relax, and enjoy the show. Pop open a brew. <laughs> and by brew, I mean and water. Coffee or water. The sugar's really bad for you. <laughs> so what are we talking about today, uh, Well, you know, first, what? I wanted to touch something that is a little near and dear to your heart. Mm. We have been messing around with this idea of airbags for motorcyclists. Yes, because, hey, that's a pretty big safety improvement for cars when they first came out. And uh, But motorcycling is the definitely dangerous, and if there's anything that can make it safer... I would more than happily try it out. There was this show on Discovery. It was on for like six episodes. It was it was during the whole when Mythbusters first came out and people were like, oh yeah, we should make things. And yeah. Their whole thing was to make stuff that was weird. And one of the things they came up with was an airbag for motorcyclists. And it was literally just a suit yeah. that would have air airbags pop out of them. And, and you, you just kind of look like this Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. Right. Like <laughs> and I remember thinking, that's the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> Mike. I mean, it, you'd roll, you'd die. But evidently, that actually kind of works. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Dianese, I think, was the first company I saw that came out with an airbag um, uh, suit that they had made. And... You know, it's you're still gonna get hurt. I don't but know. you won't get dead. <laughs> right. I, I guess is the point. Yeah, yeah. It hurts better than dead. But you know, uh, the new the new generation of these suits have really been refined, and they do things like they inflate a collar around your your neck right. to hold your head steady. Because as you know, because you do ride, yeah. One of the biggest problems is your head gets yanked in the wrong direction. And Starts rolling around. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, like some of the uh, this is something they've been using in MotoGP for a few years, where they have have sensors in the suit that detect a uh, an impact seconds I mean milliseconds right. before it, it happens and then it just deploys and they kind of they puff up and then they slide but it protects their neck and their shoulders and collarbone and stuff which right. is usually what breaks yeah yeah and I, again the key is to absorb that first impact because in most impacts not all of them but most of them something like 85 percent of the force is in that First initial hit. impact so yeah. if you could have a system that just absorbs that you greatly increase the chance that the rider is going to survive well here's the thing yeah the same company that makes the suits for riders mm -hmm. have now turned their mind to something a little differently What's that? Uh, at the start of this season's world alpine ski championship ah. in beaver creek uh, colorado skiers were launching themselves uh, down the slopes at speeds approaching 90 miles per hour so that's it, scary yeah it's like riding a bike <laughs> but there's no bike it's there's just, no brakes it's just you but they had state-of-the-art helmets gloves and that airbag suit originally designed for riders uh -huh. but adapted for skiers Nice. Uh, this thing is called the D Air Ski, and again, it's yeah. ba based off that motorcycle product by how do you say the company? Uh, Dianese. Yeah, Dianese. Now it, it's a wearable airbag. Now the cool thing is it's got three gyroscopes, three accelerometers, a GPS, replaceable cold gas canister. So it's not an explosion like a right. car airbag. It's actually compressed gas filling right. the bags, 
and then it's got a lithium ion battery to power the system. Everything fits into a hardened pocket that's located at the back of the unit, so it doesn't affect your gravity. It's, you know, right. it's, it's toward the back of the skier. Hmm. Uh, the cool thing is the system was developed over the course of two years. And uh, Alex, I think you've got some, uh, some uh, uh, photos that you can scroll through here. It, it allowed them during the development time to figure out what regular acceleration looks like mm -hmm. and the body position would look like and what a crash would look like because you spoke about this knowing the difference between crashing and then just make or just making a hard maneuver is very important right right and that's yeah a key to uh, with all the little sensors that they have and like in the pictures you can see it's in the um I don't know what the technical term, but the little neck hump that they have yeah, on motorcycle, the which thing, it, yeah. it provides, you know, when you're in the riding position, it gives you a better aerodynamics so that wind's not pulling on the back of your head, but that's also a great place to put, uh, you know, sensors for this sort of thing. Right. Uh, the, the airbag inflates in just a few milliseconds, and it stays inflated for up to 10 seconds, so the entire duration of the impact. And then they say it will absorb up to 60% of the force of that impact, which again, that's that's huge. Yeah. They even tested a couple of false positive uh, things. So what they did was they had someone skiing, and then they just set like it off fall. Oh, just okay. to see if well would it cause a crash instead of and no, it didn't. No. It allowed the skier to stay in control. So they're hmm. really refining that 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 balance between protection and not losing control of yourself or your vehicle. Right, because if uh, an airbag in a vehicle went off while you're just driving, or you you like bump into a curb. I think that's a, like always one of the jokes is like yeah. somebody will hit something and like phew, poof, and then they get hit by the airbag. Well, you see it all the time. Uh, like remember in Fight Club mm -hmm. that they you know they would hit the front of the car and either set off the car alarm or set off the, <laughs> the, the airbag, airbag, right? Yeah. Well, the the sensors and the software has become so sophisticated and they use this in the Dionysi product that it knows the difference between something hitting you or you hitting something. Right. Because the, the acceleration profile looks different. Right. Uh, and, and that's really what the, 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 the problem, uh, it, well, the, the difficulty in creating a product like this wasn't the engineering. The engineering yeah. was actually kind of easy. It was fine tuning the software to make sure it only goes off when it's needed. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's really cool. And I would love to try one, but I don't know if I want to be the person <laughs> like jumping off the bike or, you know. Oh, you're going to love this though. Because of the accelerometer and the GPS and the little computer in it, mm -hmm. you can actually download your, your ride. Your data, so, yeah. Exactly. So if you're a skier or if you're a biker, it will actually tell you, oh, you, this is your path, but then it'll also say you pulled half a G here, three Gs here, yeah. uh, you were at this angle here, and it, you can actually replay the, uh, the, the, the event uh, throughout your entire ride. I mean, that's, that's actually kind of cool. No, that's awesome. I love that stuff. And looking over the data kind of, um, there was a, a case, I think it was last year, a rider went down at like 190 <laughs> miles per hour. And the impact that they detected actually went like beyond what the sensors could <laughs> could um, record. That's but it was good. cool seeing like here he is, you know, riding along, and there's you know a consistent amount of g-force, and, and then all of a sudden it spikes up, and then oh. it shows exactly where the airbags deploy right. in his suit and the amount of time that it took to deploy, and it was like 0 .00 something of a second. Yeah, yeah. it was quick. My only question is if these are reloadable, because I would be the kind of person who would like inflate it for <laughs> <laughs> and then I want to like, like release valve and put like in another you're canister. About to, you go in, you're about to get into a fight. And That's you're a like, I'm face. tough. <laughs> it's like an app on your phone. What? Let's go, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that the ones that, for the racing that I've watched, uh, they can deploy twice. So if you crash oh, okay. more than twice, the, the little canister that is in there, because it'll inflate and then it slowly deflates. But see, that would be important for you because you don't want it to inflate yeah. and break. But for me, using it for fun, I mean, I, I'm not going to go <laughs> you right. want to so inflate, inflate as, many it as many times <laughs> as I want. That's fine. That's good. You know what they should really get you is, uh, you know, the little pumps that they have on the shoes <laughs> and just have that, like, boop, 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 Okay, boop, that's boop. not the same. you at the bar. Let's go, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. I've got to pump up. <laughs> that's a little different. Now, when we come back, we're going to go ahead and start talking about PWM. P no. I have no idea what that is. Good. Because we're going to explain. It's actually important. Whether you're mm -hmm. doing Arduino projects or mm -hmm. RC projects, you want to know what PWM is. But before we do that, hey, Brian. What's that? Did you know what the best rated home automation system at CES 2015 was? Ah, yes, I do. The one that uh, incorporates all sorts of devices that you would like to play with. Yeah, it's uh, called Smart Things. Now, we are big on home automation. I mean, it's one of the things that we've been wanting to do on Know How for a while. 
But the question is, how do you do home automation if you've got a bunch of different systems? You've got light controls from this manufacturer or door controls from that manufacturer. You've got sensors that you want to integrate into one screen so that you're not jumping from interface to interface to interface. Well, you, you could go off and, and buy some super specially designed high-tech house that will go obsolete in a couple of years. Or you could get smart things. Get smart. Now, these devices that Brian's showing off right now, I'll go ahead and switch to the overhead. This is the smart things hub. This is the start of your smart system. Now, this, again, is CNET's highest rated home smart system. It was at CES 2015. It made a huge splash. It's called smart things. It lets you monitor, control, and automate your home from anywhere using your smartphone. Now you can light your lights, you can lock your locks, you can change your thermostat and home security settings all through a single app. And you don't need a different app for every product, which is important because you want that central interface for your house. Intuitive controls allow you to set the rules on your smart home through their free iOS, Android, and Windows Phone app. And with smart things, you can customize the way that your smart devices talk to each other. So now you can tap goodnight on your phone and the lights will turn off, the thermostat will adjust down and the doors will lock. It's one of the dreams of home automation that you make it not just remote controlled, but smart. And that's what SmartThings does. Oh, even more, you can keep your home protected with SmartThings by using their home security system. It includes motion detection, water detection, and more. Uh, I love this part. You could use the security system to broadcast audio, like, for example, of, mm -hmm. of barking dogs when someone rings your bell so that you could uh, you know, scare them away from your property. Fortunately, I, I already have a Corgi for that. But what, <laughs> the use case I found is uh, my shower is really close to our closet. And it gets, it gets really moist in there. Yeah. So what I did is I got a dehumidifier, but I have it running all the time because I don't know how bad it is in there. But with the, uh, with the uh, humidity sensor, I can just set it to like, oh, right. okay. Like you, I can turn it on now. You can use the hub off. to set that parameter and say, hey, you know what? When the humidity gets above 40%, Kick on. turn on the dehumidifier. And when it gets down below 20, turn it back off. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's the sort of stuff that smart things let you do. It lets you take the home automation the way you want to do it. Not just the way that some manufacturer is going to give it to you, but say, what are the problems in your life that you want solved? Yeah. SmartThings helps you solve it. Now, SmartThings, again, was named Editor's Choice CES 2015. And, uh, well, we want to get you started up. Right now, to help you get uh, started up on your smart home, SmartThings is offering know-how listeners 10% off of any home security or solutions kit. And you get free shipping in the United States when you go to smartthings.com slash twit and use the offer code twit at checkout. That's smart things, a better home, a smarter home now. And we thank smart things for their support of know-how. There's so many of them. I know, they're really, I mean, it, the, you know, the hardest thing about smart things is putting them all, is back, putting in them the all back in the box. The way that I found it. <laughs> I'm like the master of that. It's like Tetris. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. All right, Brian, I want to mm -hmm. talk about PWM. Okay, what does that stand for, Padre? Pulse with Modulation. Pulse width modulation. Why is that important? Because you take a pulse uh -huh. and the width of that pulse uh -huh. and you modulate it. You have not helped me at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, thanks. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and go on to the next segment. No. Okay, so PWM quite simply is a way to take a clock cycle. And when we say a clock cycle, we means we need a way to keep time, like a beat, tick, 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 mm -hmm. tick, and convey some sort of information with that clock cycle. Okay. Okay. Now, to understand why this is important, let's talk a little bit about the difference between an analog signal and a digital signal. Well, if if you know if you lived in the world uh, in today's world, you probably know what digital <laughs> 2015? means. Two thousand fifteen. In two thousand fifteen. Okay. You understand that digital means it's on or off, right. right? And analog can mean that it goes analog, right? Analog has an infinite number of values. Mm -hmm. Digital can be used to approximate analog, but they're two right. very different types of signaling, right? right? And to show that off, I've got two very poorly drawn waves here. <laughs> okay. This first one is, is what you might see in an analog wave, right? It's got, there's, if you remember math, there's actually yeah. an infinite number of values that that can represent. Okay. Okay, so let's say that this is the one and that's, that's a negative one, okay? Right. So this wave can be any of the values between one and negative one, which again is infinite, mm -hmm. right? And it just depends on where it's located in this curve. These two are what a digital wave looks like. 
There is no smooth curve because it doesn't go between one and negative one. It goes between one and zero. It's like a switch. It's a switch. It's only on or only off. Now okay. that's fantastic because it also means that you can have a bit more accuracy. One of the things back from the analog age was along with this infinite number of, of uh, points was the infinite number of uh, inaccuracies that you right. can make, right? Because the difference between 0.00000001 and 0.00000002 right. was so small that unless you had really accurate uh, equipment, you really couldn't tell the difference, right? Okay, yeah. So with digital, I know it's on, I know it's off. There's no, there's no uncertainty, which is why we like using digital communications, but at times it has its issues. Here's okay. one of the issues. If I can use an analog wave to represent any number that I want, a representation of a digital wave is going to be more difficult because I only have those two values. Right. Right. So, for example, this is going to be uh, uh, th th this is actually two clocks. So there's one tick here. So there's one cl complete wave right. and one tick here. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, uh, same thing. Let's let's say that that, that same there. division. There's one tick here and one tick here. If I wanted to approximate what that analog wave could could be. Right. What I can actually do is I can turn it on and off really quickly and then take the average. Right. Right. And, okay. And is that kind of what you're showing? That's what I'm showing bottom? here. So if this is one complete uh, clock right here, it's on the whole time. So right. this would be the maximum value. Mm -hmm. So let's say this is a, an 8-bit value. So I have 256 possible values. On all the time would be 256. Okay. Right? This is on half the time. So, so this would give me, yeah, exactly, 128. Uh, now, that's good for digital values, converting digital values into something that you can approximate. But the other question is, how do you use this to communicate with analog devices? Hmm, okay. All right. So, and, and are you going to show us how? I'm going to show you really quickly. Now, we have been doing our first ever Coding 101 know-how crossover with uh, Mark <laughs> Smith Smitty. Yeah. Uh, someone I met at DEF CON. And what he's been doing is he's been showing us how to turn these, these meters, voltage meters, into a clock using... Oh, yeah, this is a cool project. An Arduino. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, Arduino, the way that we're doing this is we're using PWM. The question he had is, well, how do we represent time, which has a lot of values, with a digital output, which has two? Right. And, and what he's and been... Off. Yeah, he's been using this. So he has to fake a a analog signal because right. that's that's what's going to drive these meters with a digital device right and, and the, that's by turning it off and on at different turning rates. it off and on really really quickly so yeah. again so if 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 i have uh l let's say let's not talk about 256 let's say the value is between zero and one okay right right oh no let's say it's between zero and ten okay that's if easy. i ha if i have it on the entire clock cycle that's ten <laughs> Right. If I have it on half the clock five. cycle, that's five. If I have it on eight ticks of that clock cycle, it's eight, okay. right? And that's how I would get that value. Uh, I'm going to show you how it works really quickly by using this demonstration. If you could hold this right here, uh, mm -hmm. we actually gonna, we've got a close-up that uh, Alex can switch oh. to. There you go. Yeah, so hold that. And let me uh, do all the back-end hookups here. I had, to, yeah, I had to make this real quick last night. All right, so take that okay. and slowly turn that knob. Does it matter which direction? Nope. Okay, so let me angle this a little bit better. Ooh. Right. Actually, here, go ahead and let, let that go, and now spin that knob really quickly. Okay. Ooh, it's L turning. Let yeah, no, no, just go crank it back and forth. Oh, yeah. Okay. Whoa. There Whoa. <laughs> Calm down. This is how servos work. You give it a value, right? You give it an analog value, and the, uh, the motor will try to approximate where that value is. That's cool. Okay, so yeah, and now let, faster, let's go ahead and let's let's up the ante a little bit. We're gonna hook up your uh, your servo tester to <gasps> our, our old friend, our the old lunchbox. lunchbox. Yeah, so let's do that. I Here play you go. With this guy in a while. Take that, puppy. Okay. And uh, do the same. <gasps> ah. So this is the basis of not just the Arduino. So we were using PWM to tell the time with an Arduino, but we've we've also been using it in Project Lunchbox, and we've been using it in all of our quadcopters. PWM is the way that the flight that the receiver speaks to the flight controller and the flight controller speaks to the servos. So I, yeah, I'm I'm basically I'm the physical connection instead of being to the remote. Right. Now, this is, now yeah. what this is doing though, cool. what this is doing, it has to encode into PWM. So it's not just sending it one volt or five volts. What right. it's, what it's doing is if you have it halfway, it has it has the wave on half the time and off yeah. the half the time. If you have it cranked over all the way, 
it's all the way on. If you have it cranked all the way over, it's all the way off. Right. And as you increase, it's going to gradually increase the amount of time each clock cycle that that wave is on. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Now, it does that. Uh, I can't remember what the refresh rate on this, but I think it does it a couple of, of hundred times. I'm actually, it might be a couple of thousand times every second. That's insane. Which crazy. is what you want because you want it to check as, as often as possible to see where that, that value is. Right. Right? Neat. Which is why when we were, we're talking about uh, the speed controllers on, uh, on quadcopters, actually, let's do another demonstration here. Okay. When we were talking about the speed controllers, remember one of the things that I mentioned was that you wanted a speed controller that was fast. Right, right, because you're going to be giving a quadcopter a lot of different inputs. Right, and, and you want that thing to respond to your commands quickly. as quickly as possible. So uh, what you want is you want a speed controller that has a refresh rate that's high enough that it's going to be able to, to take those commands and turn it into something that you've actually uh, uh, given it to do. If you have a slow speed controller, you'll end up with motors that lag. All right, so this is a speed controller. This is, this is identical to one that we might use. Actually, you're... You do that. Oh, yeah. yeah sit that. There we go. Th that we might use in a quadcopter. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I pulled this out of an old quadcopter. And what this is going to do is it's going to send commands, PWM commands, to that, that speed controller. And as I increase it, it'll spin uh, it up and down. Oh, OK. Yeah, here's the little speed controller. There you go. Take that. Whee! Go crazy. Oh. Yeah. So this, this is how it's, uh, I mean, the PWM is incredibly useful because of all the different places that it turns up. It's not going to be just in quadcopters. It's not just going to be in an Arduino. It's going to be in, in any any time you try to make an analog signal with a digital device, you're going to be using PWM. Or any time you want to communicate using that that uh, that uh, pulse width modulation, you're going to be using PWM. Okay. So, yeah, it's doing its best to mimic an analog signal, and yeah. that's really fascinating. And okay. it's just a really good way, a cheap way, a very inexpensive way, and a very durable way, a consistent way of getting information across a clock cycle. Right, because I do remember watching some of the uh, you and Smitty working on that clock, yeah. and it was to get the the finite you know movement on the little dial you had to really uh, manipulate the signal to it right now eight bet steve in the chat room has a good question he says it's hard to understand the difference between the wheel servo and the constant motor the motor is the in the motor the pwm is controlling speed in the wheel server the pwm is controlling degrees of turn i understand that but imagine this all pwm is doing is it's giving you a value between zero and whatever right? right so in the servo here for the for the wheels it knows that this is zero and it knows that that is ten. full right or, or 10 whatever whatever, whatever the top with. value yeah. is for the speed controller it's the same thing but it, instead of turning a motor in one direction or another or the other it's just going from speed. zero rpms to right. whatever maximum rpm yeah, yeah zero is no volts i'm giving the motor no volts right. and the full value is i'm giving it all the volts i have yeah so it's, cool. it's it's the same thing it's the same principle it's just they're interpreting and inter in using that information in different ways that's right. the best way to say it. Very cool. There we go. Now, we've got some more PWM stuff for you, but before we get there, let's uh, go ahead and drop into uh, our Coding 101 crossover. Now, if you are here from Coding 101, this is the segment you're going to want to watch because we told you there were going to be certain things from the Coding 101 episodes that we weren't going to cover. One of them specifically was how to take your meters and turn them into something that the Arduino can use. Hey, Alex. Press that magic button. I'm here with my master builder, formerly my code warrior for Coding 101. This is Mark Smith. Now, we have been doing a project in Coding 101. You really should check it out. We're going to put the show notes. Uh, the, the link will be in there so you can check out the Coding 101 episodes in which he's been showing us how to play with these Arduinos. But this time, he wants to show us why uh, we need to convert these meters from measuring voltage into measuring current. Now, you explained this a bit on Coding 101. Yeah. Could you tell our, our know-it-alls why you need to do this? So, all right. So we have here um, a analog panel meter that is, uh, it's an analog meter, right? And so what the way these work is they have a little electromagnet down here at the bottom, and it works against a fixed magnet. And so if you pass a little bit of current through the wires in that electromagnet, it will deflect this needle across the 90 degrees from 0 to 15. Now this, this uh, meter is measured, uh, is, is labeled, excuse me, in volts, and the straight line means it's DC volts, and it's measured from 0 to 15. So you would expect that this meter will measure 0 to 15 volts. 
if you were to put a 15 volt or anything between 0 and 15 volts across the terminals on back here, you would expect that voltage to show up on the display. But Smitty, we got a problem here because an Arduino will not put out 15 volts. In that fact, is it, correct. it will cap at 5 volts. That's right. So how can I use this? If I, if I can't get in enough voltage to get all the way to the, to the top of the meter, it's kind of useless meter for me, right? That's, uh, well, no. Uh, okay, so good. the good news is that the meters are actually current meters. Remember I said you have to pass a current through the coil. The voltages are relevant. Uh, you, what matters is the amount of current going through the coil. And the way you convert a voltage to a current is using a resistor. Ohm's law equals oh, IR. Okay, right. All right. So we have a resistor there that goes between the one of the one of the you know the studs on the back goes to a resistor to the meter, and then back out to the other side. And so what that does is, if you put 15 volts across there, the 15 volts across that resistor will limit using Ohm's oh. law to one milliamp. Okay. Okay, and it's actually the resistance of that resistor plus the resistance, the internal resistance of the meter. So if I remember correctly, that's a 14.8 kilo ohm resistor or if, something if like I that. If I still had my learning, I could read the bands. Yeah, and whatever. What it was, I, but, I yeah. hooked up my meter to it. <laughs> uh, and then the internal resistance of the meter of the coil is about 200 ohms. So around there, it, it ends up being about 15 kilo ohms. And so if you put a 15 volt signal across 15 kilo ohms, that will pass one milliamp of current. So really these meters are, they're cheating, they're lying to us. They're, they're using this to convert current into voltage. Correct. We're, we're going to remove that. We're going to remove, remove that. Remove the cheat. Okay, we're going to like remove that. the cheat and we're going to turn it into a one milliamp meter. Show me. Okay. So I've got a nice soldering iron here. I'm going to clean that up a little bit. Um, I'm going to move that out of the way. And so all we're going to do is we are going to take that resistor out of the meter. You want a good soldering iron, you want a nice clean soldering iron. If you're having trouble heating up the, uh, the item, one of the trips, tricks that Spinny taught us was actually dabbing a tiny bit of solder onto the edge to help the heat flow into the, uh, the component. But remember, you don't want to keep the heat on there too long or you will damage things. That's correct. So try and do it as quickly as you can, but you are going to need to... God, why can I never line that up? And so I just put a little bit of dab of solder on there on the wire. And what I'm doing is I'm just taking out the resistor entirely and putting the wire onto the meter directly. Very cool. That's it. That's it. So that, taking out that resistor now turned it from a, a voltmeter to a current meter. Correct. Wow. Okay. That's it. And so now if I were to put one milliamp through those leads, it would read full scale. Okay, and that's exactly what we need because even though we can only output between 3 and 5 volts on an Arduino, we can output different amounts of current. Current, exactly correct. There we go. So, uh, folks, if you want to follow along in Coding 101 to see exactly how we made this, you're going to have to do an alteration to one of these meters. Now, where do they pick these up? I got these meters on Amazon. Well, believe it or not, the analog panel meters, you can get them all over the place. You can get different physical styles. Um, I picked up a couple of different styles. I got these nice round ones. They're kind of small, but I, they're... I like the old aviator ones. We've got a place here in, uh, in uh, the Northern California like those, right? They look like old pilot gauges or from mad yep. scientist machines. The, these are old Bakelite. Those um, are harder to, to change though, right? I mean, they're not as easy this, as I, some of these. I opened these up and I couldn't get to it uh, uh, without having to really tear the thing apart. Okay. But um, one of these is already one milliamp. Uh, the other one is 100 milliamps. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, we'll, uh, I, we'll play I'd, with them. I'd say get one of these on Amazon just so that you could play right away. And yep. then if you've got a surplus store nearby, why not go ahead and jump over and see what they've got? Uh, how much do these cost typically? Just a few bucks on That's Amazon. They, they were not expensive at all. Well, about this? We'll get some links for the items that you bought. We'll make yep. sure that they're in our show notes. Yes. So uh, now that you know how to do this, you can go back to Coding 101 and figure out the programming you need to do to make the Arduino do that. I hate that guy. Nerds. <laughs> <laughs> that was so cool. I Yeah, I helped you guys uh, shoot that, and that was fun to watch. It, it was, you know, and I had never thought about taking the resistor out of a meter. And right. it, it totally makes sense. I mean, I should have figured, oh, duh. Yeah. I, I was just like an idiot. I was sitting there going, well, maybe I could sit, like, use a relay and send more power to it. <laughs> no, no just easier. pop that little resistor off. Done, yeah. done. Now, we are going to be giving you more. In fact, for the next three weeks, we're going to be showing you the hardware side of that steampunk clock. Now, we're not going to show you how to build the enclosure. Unfortunately, my woodworking skills are horrible. I, I, I wish 
-hmm. someone in the audience was really good at steampunk because I love mm -hmm. steampunk. I'm, I have no artistic talent no, whatsoever. Me either. Well, I have some. I mean, compared to you, compared I have to some, me, you're, you're Picasso. <laughs> compared and compared to you, Greg is Greg, like oh, exactly. exactly. He's on another level, but, but uh, he doesn't like us mm, anymore. We'll have to come up with he something. Stormed off two weeks ago. He's like, I'm done <laughs> with no Al. He just doesn't. He's just not here on Thursdays, so it's like he doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> whatever, whatever. <laughs> but we're gonna give you more of that, and make sure if you are interested in what we're doing with the steampunk clock. You've got to check out the last two episodes of Coding 101, mm -hmm. and actually this week and next week we're going to complete the project because we've got hardware and software. Yes. This is this is the crossover thing. We, yeah. we've, we've been wanting to do this for a while because we know that uh, computer engineering or, or electrical engineering, they don't stand alone. They work yeah. best when you've got a, a little bit of each. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And. Uh I mean, this show is all about learning new stuff and putting the building things and stuff like that. And Smitty made a great point when he was here saying, you know, you might not have a project in mind right away, but yep. there might be a problem that you have that you can solve by putting these things together. And if that takes coding and soldering and, you know, so a little bit of woodworking, I'm more than happy to try that. Yeah. I, have already, I have actually already taken, I repurposed Smitty's code for the mm -hmm. Arduino because what his did was it used the PWM outputs to send slowly more and more uh, voltage yeah. into into the the, uh, the meters so that you, or current, so that you could actually see uh, you know what what time it was. I used the same thing along with. Do you remember our dancing lights projects? I yeah, used a, yeah. a, a type. Was it a 49C transistor to make lights light up and dim according to music? Uh, well, it's oh, yeah. the same principle. Yeah. So now I've actually created a clock that has no meters, mm -hmm. but the the color slowly changes throughout the day. Oh, that's cool. It's actually pretty cool. We're or gonna be we're gonna like be gets that. brighter and then it gets dim. At well, like a certain the cool point thing or... is because I, I use one of those tri strips, so it's an it's a strip of LEDs yeah. that will actually change colors depending on what kind of voltage they're they're getting off of each channel. So. Luckily, they had three channels, and we yeah. had three meters for the clock. Yeah. And so, as as the time changes, the the color of the strip changes. You don't right. see the individual LEDs; you just see it turn from yellow to green to blue to mauve. It's, I mean, That's it's cool. very impractical. Yeah, but it's Unless a fun you memorize project. Memorize that color. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's cool. it's fuchsia o'clock. Uh, it's fuchsia. Yeah, you know, it's it's again. It's one of those things where do the project. Yeah. Have it sitting around. Who knows what it's going to lead to? You don't to. know what it's going to lead to. Like, we started our, our C project with the lunchbox, and then it led us to quadcopters. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, JJ to the 4AD4 saying, Mauve. I think Mauve's a Mauve. color, right? Yeah, it could be a color. It could be. Why not? There's so many colors. It could be a flavor. Yeah. <laughs> Did everything just taste purple? <laughs> <laughs> All right, know. let's jump into some feedback. It's been a while since we've been able to take a look at some of the comments that our folks have made in our G Plus group. Brian, yes, you want to yes, take yes. us away? So. We're back to quadcopters for a sec. Yeah. This little feedback question from uh, Andy Lee. He wants to know how to carry his quad around. He wants uh, a suggestion on any carry or travel case for the FPV 250, which is the smaller one. Uh, he's been looking for some time at aluminum cases with foam inside. He'd like room for everything uh, to fit, plus a little extra space for a larger frame if he uh, chooses to upgrade in the future. And we do both have carrying cases. We, one that you actually, gave me. Yeah, yeah it's a hard <laughs> shell. But before yeah. we do that, let, let me show you really quickly one that someone in our G Plus group had. Uh, Alex, we've got a link for this. Uh, some people were talking about, well, how do I carry around my FPV 250 now that I have it? And mm -hmm. you know it can be a little unwieldy, right? Yes, yeah. Well, we've got uh, here a, a picture of what Andy Ooh. Lee did. What? Uh, yeah, he's the same person who asked the question. He, so he took, you can buy these, like at Fry's Electronics or Surplus store. It looks like a secret agent briefcase. Yeah, exactly. Now, that foam you can cut into to make inserts so that it holds everything that's supposed to be in there. This is essentially the same as the case that I gave to you, right? I yeah, mean, it, that so, looks like, yeah, and you got to be careful with the propellers and stuff. If you don't want to be disassembling it all the time, it's nice right. to have a case that, you know, the propellers fit in. Yeah. Now, this one is nice. This one's nice. But as you said, there is one problem. Go to the next picture, Alex. There's one issue, and that is the way the props are there. Oh, uh, yeah. Gotta be careful with those. You're going to snapping stuff off, right? Yeah. And that's kind of a pain in the butt. What we've been doing is you take the props off, and then you store them that's, away. Yeah, what I've been doing. But that kind of, I mean, it's, I know it's not much time. I have to bring a little wrench with me everywhere I go. Right. And yeah. it, I mean, I, I like just pulling it out of the bag and being able to go. Yeah. Which is why I stole this <laughs> from the basement. Don't um, tell Bert because yeah. he was looking for this while you were gone, I and I was like, I have no idea where that might have gone. Use this for Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> you I was, wanted I to. Had it for two weeks. <laughs>
<laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Bork. Really uh, but it, it went to a good cause. It, it got did. a quadcopter. And now here, here's the cool thing. This this is my I'm calling this my completely, absolutely, totally ghetto bag. Ghetto? Why? Uh, because it wasn't designed for this. No, this is for a camera. <laughs> it's for a camera, but it has this nice hard shell, it or hard-ish shell. And then a nice foam like inside. Right, but the important thing was, if you look inside, it's big enough that I can put the entire quadcopter in there without having to take the props off. Yes, yeah. and I think it has a little LED has light. A little LED light. Now, now one of the things, the re reason why I did this is because I can actually stack two of them because what? I have, I you know, I go around with two different what? quads. That's the crazy quad. That's the one with the ridiculous yeah. amount of acceleration. I heard you like quads, so I put a quad on top of your quad. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it also has all my props right here. It's got my transmitter. It's got my battery. And because this is a semi-hard case, it means that uh, I'm gonna, um, you know, everything is relatively safe. I've, I've actually got in there. I did drop this off the back of the the car, off the what? back of the tailgate. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, go so you got your toolkit in there. You got your remote. What else? You uh, oh, well, the remote's in there. On the sides, I've got the chargers and the batteries. On the other sides, I've got uh, additional tools for when I break. Things, oh. but uh, see this. This is the ghetto part. Um, <laughs> <the> <laughs> so you got creative with some gaffer's tape. Uh, huh? I got creative with gaffer's tape, and this is just pick and pull foam. So I had yeah. a bunch of this <laughs> from Pelican cases that I've got, uh, and all it's I did like a bento box right, for your quad. Right. Yeah. And so all I did was I just I made it into the form of my quadcopter, uh, including the legs. So I don't have to take anything off. That's cool. This this is I pull this out of this this case, and it is ready to fly immediately. That's awesome. And when I put it back. Back in uh, the in nice it. thing nice about this cozy. is it's nice and cozy and I don't have to worry about bending props uh, and I can actually take this because see it's it's like a nice little rectangle I can yeah. take this out of this bag and, and shove it into a backpack something so else yeah. these are kind of like portable units now yeah that's, uh, that's a good idea because uh, so what happened to me is I uh, I wanted to take this on a ride and I wanted to put it in my backpack yeah. but I basically just put the frame and then all the props in like another pocket yeah. and it wasn't it's, that good and then you have to stop and you have to reassemble it yeah. and if you're in a rush you're like oh and the, the props gonna fly off and that's I'll crash cool. but this is yeah this is ready state you can fly it where did you right get out the box. so the foam I'm guessing is pretty cheap and super cheap the I, box uh, I actually <laughs> this was this was excess this was stuff that pixel core threw away <gasps> so I just taped a bunch of it together. Where would people get it if they wanted to? Uh, put you go to stuff Amazon. To go Amazon. Yeah, seriously, go to Amazon. Stuff up. Now, if you wanted to go super hardcore, you could do something like what you have, which is essentially a Pelican case. It's, which it's, I didn't bring because yeah, I yeah. didn't look at yeah. the. <laughs> I forgot it at home. I rode my motorcycle Even though today. it says it in the notes, but... Oh, no, no, but, but no, it's... Everyone's seen a Pelican case, right? Yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard shell, shell polycarb. Yeah. Super, super strong. Uh, and all it means is that it's going to be able to survive a lot of abuse. Right. But and this bag already does. The cool thing you did with that other case, too, is that you um, you attached some bungee cords to the top. So right. I was able... I can fit my Sima in there and just, like, attach it to the top of the case. Yeah. And then below is where the 250 goes. I, I think that's kind of a... That's a... a a trend for me in all of my cases where mm -hmm. I, I want more than one quadcopter. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Either I either the Sima and the FPV 250, or in this case, I'm doing an FPV 250, and then I'm doing the crazy one that does GPS and FPV. Yeah. And, so on and so forth. Well, my my uh, use case has been I will I want to fly both my quads, and I fly the little one first to kind of warm up. Yeah. You know, get yeah. get the old joints working, and then uh, and then move to the big one when I'm uh, like, okay, now I'm not gonna crash right off the bat. Now people are asking if there's any uh, alternative materials that I recommend. Uh, the, I love the pick and pull foam just because it is so easy. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and actually, th this is kind of weird. So what I had to do, if you go to the overhead again, uh, I I cut through the side before I pulled it because I didn't want to cut all the way down. Yeah, you want to give uh, yourself yeah. some. A smarter way to do it would be to get, instead of one big thick lump of pick and pull, mm -hmm. get like two half sheets of pick and pull, mm -hmm. and then just pick and pull off the top layer and then glue oh, them yeah. together. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you could also do this with just like foam, just fine junky foam. <laughs> You're gonna have a lot of waste problems. Though, a waste, waste of foam? You, well, because you get like little beads of uh, the foam. Yeah, how did you cut it? Uh, with you, just a kitchen knife. Oh. <laughs> um, there is another way that you can do this, and it's actually a project for our future know-how. What's that? Let's just say that it involves, remember a couple weeks back I posted a picture, I couldn't sleep, so I went to Home Depot and I picked Oh, yeah, there's some project that you were working on? Yeah, yeah that's actually part of this? this much better. Hmm, yeah. all right, all right. right. So next well, question. Moving on, and this comes from David Wiggins yes. from our G Plus group. 
I don't know if you've all seen this or not, but I have to say it's beautiful. Would Instamorph be too heavy to make this work? Uh, sorry to, for adding to the quad madness. No, never apologize for that. And uh, he doesn't have a quad himself, but his question is more of a theoretical one and probably just a shameless attempt to get a shout out on the show. And so you've gotten it, David. You've gotten it, yeah. But, and actually, uh, yeah, no one sent us links to the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> that was this completely. Th no. my, yeah, my email blew up and Twitter and Facebook yeah. and but you know what that's fine because this thing is super cool it is super cool but we will say this David Wiggins you did get your shout out and you know what <laughs> and that's it everyone gets one that's right and now <laughs> and uh, you just used up everyone's one so uh, chat room <laughs> go get them that's right. No one else gets a no shout gets out. From no, no more. David Wiggins <laughs> used it up. <laughs> Except for our next feedback question, <laughs> who comes from Adam L. Derisi. This, this guy's so active in the group. I, I love him. Uh, Adam, do me a favor. If you could record a YouTube video of you saying your name properly, <laughs> three so times, we, we will pronounce it because you're always in our feedback yes. episodes. If, could you let us know how to say it so we say it properly? <laughs> <laughs> and so his question is about managed and unmanaged switches uh, with VLANs and link, link aggregation. Yeah, okay. So, so we're getting to the enterprise tech stuff. We kind of do, but, but this, it's actually a good question because you can do VLANs and link aggregation even with consumer stuff. For example, if you're running DDWRT, on uh, all your old oh, Linksys yeah, yeah. WRT54G router, right? right? Here's the issue. Uh, we typically think of managed switches and unmanaged switches, mm -hmm. right? And managed switches means you can do all that cool stuff. You could do queuing, you could do link aggregation, you could do VLANs. It, that's, that's why it costs a lot more because right. there's a lot more hardware and a lot more software to make it so flexible. Unmanaged switches would be things like that eight port switch sitting on your desk that all it does is it, it takes one connection in and it branches it out to others. Okay. okay. There are no smarts in those. They're, they're typically, they're, they're dumb switches. They don't do link aggregation. I mean, in fact, right. if you plug in two different links from the same switch into them, they typically will turn themselves off uh, because of some sort of spanning tree. Right. Uh, and they kind of strip out VLANs. And remember, VLANs are those virtual LANs that we're going to be talking about right. in a couple of weeks. Actually, we had a really good question about how to set that up. We're gonna do give you a. We're a, gonna get more into step. that. Oh yeah, uh, but there is a midway, and the midway is to go with what's called a smart switch, which is not unmanaged, but it's not nearly as good as a managed switch. It's kind of like right in the middle. It's right in the middle, and it, uh, smart. Some smart switches will do link aggregation, but the big thing for me is the VLANs because VLANs are important. If you have a network using VLANs, mm -hmm. and you plug in a switch that doesn't support VLANs. You get all sorts of funkiness. And, okay. You know, best case scenario, nothing will work. Worst case scenario, it starts injecting stuff into the network. That's ah. that's yeah. You okay. don't want to do that. But a smart switch is smart enough to recognize a VLAN tagged frame mm -hmm. and pass it along. It may not actually understand what it is, but it knows it well enough to say, "I'm just going to push this out. I'm going to make sure it goes to where it's supposed to go." So, for example, if I have a uh, very common occurrence in enterprise networks. Mm -hmm. If I have a VLAN that's set up just for my phones, so anytime a phone plugs in, it gets put off into its own virtual network. Right. The smart switch won't actually be able to understand what's inside that packet, but it will recognize, oh, that's a VLAN tag for this. I have a phone plugged into me. It should go to that. And the phone will continue, to, will be able to speak through that unmanaged switch mm -hmm. uh, even though the switch doesn't understand what's going on. Okay. All right. So it's kind of a uh, not a band aid, but not. Yeah. It's it, like not that as good as a managed switch. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, can so can you combine managed and unmanaged switches? Yes, you can. Um, do I do it? Yes, I do. But if I had my druthers and an unlimited amount of money, I would <laughs> I would do all managed switches. That's, right. Yeah, right. Just, but well, that's you know, just... I don't have five thousand dollars to spend on every switch. Jeez. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. Maybe someday. Maybe. <laughs> Dream sequence. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I know that this was a lot of information, and we mm -hmm. are going to make sure that everything gets put into our show notes. Oh, and by the way, mm -hmm. we are getting back into quadcopters. This is officially, officially 
We're hooked. The last episode of February, and we promised that we wouldn't do a quadcopter build until we got to March. Well, guess what next episode is? <laughs> is it March already? March. <laughs> it's so, gone uh, by fast. Yeah, for, for like the next three months, right. we, we're going to be uh, upgrading the FPV. That's one of the very first things we're going to be doing. We're going to yep. show you a couple of simple things you can do to your FPV 250 to make it perform better, to make mm -hmm. it handle better. We're going to show you how to build one of the big ones, the Dead Cats or the Alien Xs, so that you could do these beautiful uh, aerial photography. Oh, aerial yeah. That's what I want to do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I built you one. So. <gasps> mm, Surprise! Go figure. Sweet. And, uh, oh, and we're also going to be doing a couple of episodes on, on some of the support topics. So, for example, hmm. as we get to the bigger quads, you're going to need to have, you're going to have to balance your propellers. Right. We could get away with it when we were doing these five inches because they're so small, but right. as we get bigger, the bigger props are going to add so much vibration to your frame that you won't be able to get good video. And that little blue thing you had on the table earlier? Yeah, was... we're going to be showing you how to do some thrust testing. <laughs> <laughs> but for those of you who might be, I don't know, how could you be put off about quad stuff? Because that stuff's awesome. But we will be doing other things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. I we've... don't think I've told Padre any of my plans. <laughs> cause... Well, we've got but a couple of Raspberry Pi we got uh, Raspberry Pi projects. Bunch I of networking get... stuff. Bunch of networking stuff. Yeah, the Raspberry Pi, I want to do the main uh, thing again, because that's yep. been over a year since I've done that, and the new and, one and came out. Yeah, I think we could update that. We could bit. update that. Yeah. I have a wearable watch that I teased a long time ago, and I lost when the no hole got moved. Imploded. And then I found it again, so I'll be doing the wearable watch that you build yourself um, how to fix your old Xbox 360 uh, and then we're gonna try and do some beer segments like how how beer is made and I we have so many beer, local breweries that it. we're gonna try and visit some of those places so there's lots of stuff we have planned out you yeah. just made all those up right now didn't you I have a list. It's okay. written on a napkin. You just got called out, son. <laughs> That's it. Well, you know what, Alex? You're going to help me make all that stuff. So. <laughs> well, before we say goodbye, uh, we do have a parting shot. Um, hey, Alex, if uh, you ever wanted to build a tambourine, did you know that you only need a tambourine? Mr. Tambourine Man? <laughs> I, used, okay. I used to think this was so weird, but then I started searching around on YouTube, and evidently, the, like, that's a thing? in a huge part of the world, that's how you drive piles. See, I would never, I have no rhythm. I would never be able to do that. <laughs> I'd be the guy on the end, just, whoops. I, I'd be the sad guy that I climb up, and like before anyone else climbs up, it just goes, <laughs> oh. You would be very valuable. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't forget, you can find all of our episodes and our show notes. Where, Brian? At twit.tv slash kh. And uh, you can find a way to download in any format that will appease your device. Yes, yeah, so check those out. That's where all our show notes are. You'll probably, after an episode like this, you'll need to run through those and see what we talked about. Um, yeah, so go there, subscribe. Oh, yeah, that was a fun episode. Uh, we got a shout-out from Instamorph. They were, uh, on my Twitter feed, they're like, we were wondering why we got a big boost of traffic. It's thank, like, well, because... Thank Patrick for Patrick that. Patrick did an awesome Because we talked about it before, but we had no good ideas until Patrick <laughs> yeah, came we're on. We were like, look, Instamorph, yeah. it's cool. We know this is if fun. If we had any artistic ability. <laughs> <laughs> Padre makes squares, and I make <laughs> little <laughs> little army dudes. I, like. those, were not, those were ashtrays. <laughs> <laughs> really ugly here, ashtray. Here, Mom, here's an ashtray <laughs> I made you. He puts it on the fridge. I know you don't <laughs> smoke, but... <laughs> <laughs> right next to like the uh, the clay oh, coffee cup so that you made sad. that doesn't hold coffee. <laughs> it was uh, a pencil holder. Uh, also, don't forget that we have a Google Plus group. Actually, it's a very active Google Plus group. For yes. those people who say Google Plus are dead, I say, you're dead. So is your mic. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Padre's mic died. <laughs> All right, Fajr, you're done talking. Uh, so yeah, follow us on Google+. Uh, we're also on Twitter. I'm uh, Twitter at Cranky underscore Hippo. He's at Padre SJ. That's at Padre SJ. Um, yeah, I should just finish up the show. Uh, I do want to give one shout out, though. Uh, <laughs> one more shout out to my sister-in-law, Crystal. It was her birthday last week. I told her I wouldn't do this, but I'm doing it. So and. Winking for Greg. So that's the end of Know How.
Uh, now that, oh, do you wanna, just, just do the mouthing and I'll say it. Now that you know how, go do it. Shoot, shoot. Are we gonna use that? <laughs>